All right, so it's July 4th, and conveniently, I'm going to talk about freedom. Only, I'm going to be doing it from the point of view of the final sections for Simone de Beauvoir's The Ethics of Ambiguity. Uh, it's been a long time since I finally got done, finished the book, put this together. And so here's a video for the final bit. I don't know what our next uh, book report's going to be, but uh, as a change in pace, I want to focus on what I think is a central thesis to this whole uh, deep dive into existentialism, which is that I think that the existential philosophy gets a bad rap as being kind of dour and depressing. And I actually think that here, especially as we talk about the end here of, amb of Ethics of Ambiguity, uh, it's actually a very optimistic outlook on life, or at least it can be and it can be empowering. So let's start and define some terms because it's been a little bit since we've done this, probably actually several months, so I'm bad at this. Anyway, absurdity challenges ethics by trying to reconcile that you live in this universe that it just exists and it doesn't care about people, and people want to have meaning in their life and need to want to find it. And so... That's what absurdity is. Ambiguity is, according to uh, Simone de Beauvoir, it's acknowledging what she calls the antinomies that attach to every decision and decision that has to be made. What is an antinomy, you ask, or antinomies? They're basically a paradox in a belief. Um, for example, a common one you might hear is the paradox of thrift, right? Where, you know, sometimes spending or investing money is a better use for your money than saving. That might be a pretty terrible explanation, but basically what she's saying is that when you make a decision, sometimes your decisions are going to have paradoxes involved. There's no, there's not always going to be the perfect, right, good decision. So the first part of the, the finale, the chapter here that we're talking about, she walks through art and science. I'm going to try and uh, make sure to let you know when we're using specific quotes here. Uh, one quote, uh, art and science do not establish themselves despite failure, but through it. And I think that's where we start on this whole existentialism is a whole lot more optimistic than people give it credit for. We learn through failure and success is birthed through multiple failures. Very rarely will you ever see someone get something right on the first try. And even if they do, that first try is kind of, kind of an artificial first try. You're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, you didn't just figure that out on your own. You had years or generations of thought that had gone into it, and that's why you were able to succeed on the first try, because other people have already figured out multiplication, for example. But you can't know when you start something whether this is going to be the time you succeed or if it's going to be another failure. And that's part of the absurdity in decision-making, right? Like, the world doesn't care about you. You could just fail another 90 times. But you're going to keep doing it despite all of those failures and despite that, in general, your life might end up being more failures than successes. You may only succeed after a lot of hard work, but you're going to keep trying because honestly, and this is something I've learned, failure's not that bad most of the time. And honestly, success is very often worth the risk of failure. Um, this is a general life philosophy. Don't apply it to gambling because the house always wins there. You won't be successful gambling. You'll eventually lose. Anyway, uh, Next up, de Beauvoir, de, Simone de Beauvoir states that man must in any event assume his finiteness, not by treating his existence as transitory or relative, but by reflecting the infinite within it, that is, by treating it as an absolute. So we'll break that down base, very quickly. Basically, you've only got so much time, so don't spend it stuck in that quagmire. Yes, your decisions are absolute. Once you've decided to go right instead of left, you can never roll back time, rewind to a save point, and go left instead of right. But you still have to make a decision, right? And as we've discussed previously, as far as existentialists 
are concerned, not making a decision is a valid decision, but it is still a decision. So you have X amount of time. So don't squander it, paralyzed by the fear of making a choice because it may not be the perfect choice. Do your best to make it as right as possible, but accept that you often have to make a choice and just do it. Um, how does how does she put it? Like this. Freedom is achieved absolutely in the very fact of aiming at itself. This requires that each action be considered as a finished form whose different moments, instead of fleeing toward the future in order to find their justification, reflect and confirm one another so well that there is no longer a sharp separation between the present and future, between means and ends. So we'll break that down again real quick. Uh, you don't free yourself from all of the things that hold you back if you don't make a decision, right? You you need to consider your decision as a finished form, whose you know different moments are going are fl going towards the future. You made a decision, you're going forward with it. Now this doesn't mean that if you made a bad decision, keep going down a bad path. What it means is that you've made your decision. Don't agonize over what you what you could have or should have done. Your new reality is now that this decision was made, and maybe your future decisions need to pull you away from that if it was a bad decision. But it was made. If you agonize over it, you're going to just get stuck. Now, she's not saying, you know, don't think about them. You should reflect on them. Don't make your decisions lightly or frivolously. But since you're never going to have perfect and information or be able to reconcile every single one of your ideals with every decision that you make, Sometimes you just have to make a decision and let it go and move on. So, obviously, now that we've been talking all about this, you're probably wondering, okay, so what advice is she going to give you to, you know, help make a decision? As is traditional for philosophers, pretty much none. Ethics, she says, does not furnish recipes any more than do science and art. Side note. Uh, cooking is actually a science or an art, mattering how you look at it. But anyway, ethics does not furnish recipes any more than do science or art. One can merely propose methods. She does try and propose some methods for dis for making decisions. We went over this, you know, proper reflection, understanding the consequences of your choice, and accepting, you know, you won't know everything, ambiguities, the antinomies, all of that. So she gave you some methods. But she's not going to she's not going to let you off the hook. You're you're on your own there once it comes to how to make those decisions. So what does it mean by, you know, man, the individual must be free? For Beauvoir, uh, it means that there's a concrete bond between freedom and existence. Uh, the joy of existence, she says, must be asserted in each and every instance. If we do not love life on our own account and through others, it is futile to seek to justify it in any way. Which is actually a really uplifting way to look at things, right? After all of the relative doom and gloom of your decisions are going to matter, you have to you have to decide, and who knows, you're probably going to make a whole bunch of bad decisions and failures throughout life, but you got to just keep going. But in the end, your freedom and existence is based on, you know, loving yourself and knowing that there are other people out there who, you know, Sure, they're the other, and you can never truly know them and all of, all of that, but also, they're out there, and they're people, and equally free people, and we're all kind of in this mess together. And that's kind of an uplifting thought. We're here, we're together, so, you know, we're going to have to figure it out as a group, a team. Um, is this kind of ethics individualistic? Uh, Beauvoir's answer is obviously yes. Uh, she says that it accords to the individual an absolute value, and it recognizes in him alone the power of laying the foundations of his own existence. He exists only by transcending himself, and his freedom can be achieved only through the freedom of others. This comes back to that whole we're all in this together, right? I, If my decisions to be free are always stomping on others, those are... The, here's where we get to the, the, the ethics of ambiguity. That's bad ethics. You should not be making those sorts of decisions. So she kind of lied when she said she wasn't going to be able to, you know, give you a recipe. One, At least one part of that recipe is that you can only achieve true freedom through the freedom of others. So let's close out on her conclusion, which also sums up uh, a good 
general thesis on freedom as it relates to existential thought. The fact remains that we are absolutely free today, she says, if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness, which is a long way of saying that man has to accept freedom and it's given, right? You've been given this chance of freedom, you need to accept it and do something with it. Uh, that's a very existentialist view of freedom. Hmm. Uh, my camera's off-centered, whatever. Anyway, but remember, even in Beauvoir's own lifetime, there was a acknowledgement that there's also external factors in freedom. She lived through World War II, and freedom isn't just something that you could just think about and accept as like, yes, I'm free because I made a decision to be free. It's also something you can't really just take for granted. And with July 4th, conveniently, uh, to help tie this all together, uh, man is free, she says, and he must assume his freedom and not flee it. And that's, you know, basically the mes message of July 4th. And if you look at the American ideal of freedom, it has slowly done this, right? There were mistakes made. America has gotten better as a country as we have gone along because ultimately the goal is freedom. And that is a powerful thing to remember and conveniently tied in with our, our book report. So take a moment, reflect on that freedom, both the internal freedom that you have to decide what you're going to do, what you're going to value, and how you're going to achieve that, but also just the external concept of rights and freedoms and how maybe maybe you're not from America, I don't know, It's going. this is going out to the internet and anyone can read it, but for Americans, freedom is more than just you know, a piece of paper or a concept. It's an ideal, but it's also an action that needs to be pursued through your own choice and beliefs. So normally, that was a really good ending, I think. And I just end it right there. But the only reason I got to that ending is because I took all of these other ideas, because uh, this this section of the book is was like 20-some pages. So there were a lot of tangents that I would normally have gone on. I saved them for the end because I'm trying to get better with uh, self-control. So here's just some quotes kind of just discombobulated that I thought would be interesting. Uh, here's a quote. Um, if I were doing more videos, I'd probably mine it for clickbait because it's interesting. But de Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir says, as for revolutionary humanism, it accepts only rarely the tension of permanent liberation. It has created a church where salvation is bought by membership in a party as it is bought elsewhere by baptism and indulgences. That's a really big idea, would be interesting to talk about more, but we're not, we're moving on. Another quote, uh, after debating exactly what actions are or not are not ethical, uh, the author comes up with this. Love authorizes severities which are not granted to indifference. Uh, she later states, we object to inquisitors who want to create faith and virtue from without. We object to all forms of fascism which seek to fashion the happiness of man from without. This marries up really perfectly with one of my more often used, maybe not one of my favorite, but C.S. Lewis often warned against the tyranny of sincerely exercised for the good of its victims. It's really interesting seeing this same idea come from these two philosophers who probably would differ a lot if you sat them down in a room to talk, but they both came to the same idea, right? People can be tyrants for our own good, and it's just as bad or worse than any other kind of tyranny. Uh, another quote from, from the chapter. One of the concrete consequences of existentialist ethics is the rejection of all previous justifications which might be drawn from the civilization the age, and the culture. It is a rejection of every principle of authority. To put it positively, the precept will be to treat the other as a freedom, so that his end may be freedom. In using this conducting wire, one will have to incur the risk in each case of inventing an original solution. I like this idea, right? Like, you, can't, you don't have one size fits all, but that doesn't matter. Your freedom is in... in not instinctively, is inextricably tied to another's. And so you're going to have to think about it and come up with an original solution anytime these 
these principles come into conflict. And it's going to be hard, but it's worth it. Um, I think this is the last tangent, uh, second to last tangent that I thought was big enough to tack on here at the end. There's a theory on evil that is uh, that evil is caused by a misordering of goods. Um, I think Augustine actually called it a misordering of loves, not goods, but that gets a little... I, I think I like the phrase, a misordering of goods, better. Uh, Beauvoir says, Certainly there are hierarchies among the goods desired by men, but when it is a question choosing among freedoms, how shall we decide? I think there's like a paragraph or two where she goes about discussing it, but it's another time where like two philosophers who I probably wouldn't agree on a whole lot come to this same concept and then how they resolve it is different. And it's a concept, again, I use the misordering of, of goods is a, I like to say it's kind of an agnostic way of looking at ethics. There's a lot of ethics that are tied to a religious or a philo philosophical standing, but everyone can understand that, hey, there's so many, there are good things in the world, but if you put one good thing above another good thing, you've got to, you know, weigh some, weigh some risks. So it would be interesting to, you know, look at on a bigger picture. Um, another quote for maybe later, and uh, I saved this one for last because I think it helps encapsulate everything and bring us to a good close. We, we in this case being uh, the author here, Simone de Beauvoir, we repudiate all idealisms, mysticisms, etc., which prefer a form to man himself. And ultimately, that's a really great, solid ethical framework to start from. That's going to be good for you know your the this idea of the existentialist freedom, right? If your cause or ideal prefers that over actual real life people, if pursuing whatever ideal you are is going to be bad for actual people, you may want to relook at that cause or ideal. And there's a she goes into a lot of this. It's like it takes up a good like three or four pages in there that sometimes you do have to make that decision, but it shouldn't be done lightly, and it needs to be done, you know, eyes wide open. But it also shouldn't, it shouldn't be because they preferred that solution. It should be, you know, it is the only solution left that, you know, can be done, and even then, maybe not, right? That's something to look at later. But to go back to what we were supposed to close on is that, you know, that, I think, is that this whole existential freedom and what is, what, are, what does, what do we do to get to freedom for existentialism here is that we, do, we have to base our decisions without knowing everything. And despite not knowing everything, you have to make those decisions and you have to pursue this freedom to make those decisions and to follow through and make, and, you know keep going and just, you know, not let yourself get stopped. Um, and that ultimately is the very end of our, you know, I think I started this maybe last year. That showed you how long it took me um, to do this. Our book report here on uh, the ethics of ambiguity. I don't know if I'll do another book report like this just because writing it up, putting it together, and then it, the few times where I've done a video part of it, eat up a lot of time, more time than I think I like to use, because I could have probably read three or four books in the time it took me to do it this way, but I enjoyed it, and I hope uh, everyone else did too. Thank you, and uh, take care. Happy 4th of July.